Let, let's do the Fourth Amendment search and seizure. Interesting case, unanimous decision, which tells you a lot about the decision. Uh, the fact pattern of the case, I don't know the lower court decisions, except for what I surmise from the Supreme Court. The um, Okay, so uh, basic idea is husband gets into a fight with his, with his wife. At some point during the argument, puts a weapon of sorts on the table and asks his wife to terminate him. Uh, I'm using these ridiculous euphemisms. Uh, the wife uh, leaves the house, goes to a hotel, gets concerned, calls the police. Police show up. He's on the porch, admits basically the tenor of his disagreement with his wife, agrees to go to a psychiatric uh, hospital for evaluation, gets in an ambulance after having been assured by the police that no one's going to um, no one's going to uh, seize any of his firearms or whatever he's got in his house, uh, gets in and goes. Apparently, the police relay misrelay that discussion to his wife. They say that they need to get into the house without a warrant, without any authorization from court. Under the concept, you'll explain to me what it is. It is the community caretaker concept. And they proceed to go into his house without a warrant, without any authorization, and seize his firearms. Um, and he sued. And the lower courts seem to have upheld the search and seizure on that basis is that fair enough? And for anybody who doesn't know what the community caretaker principle is, is that a principle of law that people should be aware of or that exists in the States? It was an attempt by policing officials and States across the country to carve out another exception to the fourth amendment. And in this context, this was the case where the Biden administration argued to circumvent the second amendment as well, that you could have on grounds of, public health, go around seizing people's guns, even inside their own homes, as well as on the grounds of public health, seize uh, them or seize or search anything they wanted under the community care, so-called community caretaker exception. It's another one of those doctrines that was mostly invented by governments that was green lit by lower courts. Supreme Court never said anything like this at all. And the only con they did mention that in the decision, they said, we've never said, it. <laughs> I mean, verbatim, we've never issued, you know, interpreted it this way. Sorry to interrupt. That's exactly right. And so it was, and partially it's on the Supreme Court for letting this fester. They do this a lot. They let lower courts come up with creative inventions. So usually it's governments come up with creative uh, inventions of prior court cases that they know is wrong. They did this famously in the Rooker Feldman doctrine that was just made up. And they, they allow this bastardized version to grow and expand and wait a couple of decades before they step in and clear it up, uh, unfortunately. So the this case had Second Amendment implications and Fourth Amendment implications and lockdown implications, which you partially see reflected in the concurring decisions issued. So uh, very good news that Justice Thomas's decision was the a, a five-justice ju decision. Roberts and Breyer wrote their concurrence. Uh, Alito and Kavanaugh wrote their concurrence, but it was very rewarding to see that the five justices joined Thomas's opinion. So it's the binding president because it means it likely has consequences that Roberts and Breyer and Alito and Kavanaugh are pretending it doesn't have because uh, they, re they reference in their concurring opinions. This could be interpreted as impacting red flag laws as in red flag laws being unconstitutional. This could be interpreted in a wi wide range of contexts. Uh, this could be interpreted to limit the emergency exception that they use to raid people's houses, which is usually bogus too. Um, and so the uh, so in that, but technically they don't fully deal with that, but it does have those potential ramifications. But so the key was the there was no community. The community caretaker reference simply came from a case where they pulled over somebody on the side of the road and said you could search or seize a gun in a in in that situation. That's a totally different. Uh, situation, circumstance. They protect cops' ability to do things on the road. I think more so than is justified, but totally different than a broad walking community caretaker exception to probable cause and, and definitely in the house environment and in the gun environment. So it, the all nine justices agreed there is no such community caretaker exception to the Fourth Amendment, period. It doesn't apply in the home context ever. Uh, it doesn't apply in the gun context, period. So those are major, major rulings. And interesting enough, I'll give Kagan and Sotomayor credit because they have been stronger on Fourth Amendment issues and they joined Thomas's decision. Uh, it was good to see Gorsuch, not a surprise, 
Thomas and Gorsuch are the best on Second and Fourth Amendment law. Uh, but it was very promising that Barrett joined that five judge justice majority too. I think she will be good on Second Amendment issues, but this is the first time she's been very good on Fourth Amendment issues. So and, that's a promising indicator. And and that is the distinction here that this was not specifically, but only incidentally or tangentially a Second Amendment issue in that this was search and seizure. So the court could get around or they could carve out the fact that it was a firearm that was at issue, but you know, treat it only as a search and seizure issue. Yep. The idea being that maybe they're going to come down differently when it comes down to Second Amendment issues and red flag laws, or did you get an indication from this that it's going to reflect? Well, the reason the why they wrote concurring decisions, Roberts and uh, Breyer wanted to preserve the emergency exception, so they pointed out it doesn't impact the emergency exception. But again, the five justices didn't join that concurrence. And then the uh, Kavanaugh-Alito reference that it didn't necessarily impact red flag laws. But again, Thomas's decision doesn't say that. So I think, you know, Thomas carved out a very broad Fourth Amendment provision. And what Biden administration was effectively arguing was for kind of a exception to the Second Amendment that would create an exception to the Fourth Amendment, that because it's a gun and it's dangerous, you should be able to use your public health excuse to seize it in even inside somebody's home. That that was the argument they made on this case. And that was completely rejected. Now, no I mean, court, nobody accepted it. I guess and you're gonna have to flesh out the, the red flag laws. I mean, I have an idea as to how they what, what they are, but when I read this, at the very least, the decision without having read the underlying proceedings or the previous court case, the court judgments, this rang as it sounded like a red flag law where you know, the, the search and seizure was an, it was an incidental issue to the fact that this was a guy having mental problems, some psychological troubles, voluntarily went to a psychiatric evaluation. And it was a question of seizing the firearms in particular to prevent the potential. Was it, in the underlying decisions or the underlying proceedings, was it played strictly as a search, a seizure, Fourth Amendment, or were they discussing even incidentally potential red flag laws in this particular case? Well, where this came up was actually at oral argument before the Supreme Court. It was Biden's solicitor general that argued because it was a gun issue, you should have a public health exception to search and seize it. That that they were arguing that, you know, maybe you generally don't have a caretaking exception to the Fourth Amendment, but in the context of guns and public health, maybe you need, then you should. And the fact they did almost all the red flag laws are premised upon the, an idea of public health community caretaker exceptions to constitutional rights, including the second and the fourth. And this is and almost all the lockdown logic that gets into Fourth Amendment issues is based on that. So th the fact that they shot that down, it, it shoots it all down. In other words, you're back to emergency exceptions, the only ones. Now, the hot pursuit case is still pending before them. So we'll see whether that's the other main exception right now. Uh, but the uh, the only ones that that they really talk and again five said the, the majority binding precedent was there's no community caretaking exception period and there maybe there's emergency exceptions but we don't deal with that but community caretaking in public health ain't one of them so that has big ramifications across the board that are very promising uh, moving forward. Now, I'm going to read this one from Little Rock and then ask you a question about red flag laws. Had a recent case about dog search and Eighth Circuit overturned my win. The cops basically used the dog to circumvent the fourth. This was dog use on car in front of storage building with warrant on storage. Okay, that's interesting. Those are the magic dogs. It's like cops have magic smelling abilities. <laughs> you may not know it, but they, they can smell marijuana miles away. Uh, they, they, they can smell all kinds of things. I, I'm uh, telling they, you something. And, and this is where the dogs smell things that dogs usually don't smell and they say oh the dog was barking or, or the dog didn't smell they just claim the dog did and so the, it's another way they try to get around it uh now arguably under the coco decision uh this should not be approved or okay because you can't use infrared to search a house how can you search a house or search a building or search a property through a dog's nose that that's somehow supposed to carve out an exception and more often than not, if you really know how that this works, nine times out of ten, it's a scam. The, co the cops are just, what it is is they'll search it, and if they don't find anything, they'll let you go, and they know most of the time you're never going to sue. So they, that, that, And then when they magically find it, it justifies why they searched it anyway. Yeah. 
Some yeah, everybody mother- can't smell weed, <laughs> but cops smell weed when nobody else can. All right, wait, lit and unlit are two different smells. I guess you know what they're not. No, never mind. Discussion for another day. Kids are watching. Um, Robert, the question is, what states have red flag laws, if any, and what's the status on the discussion of those? Because I know one thing. I, at one point I said, you know, I like Dan Crenshaw. And then a lot of people who took issue with his position vis-a-vis red flag laws, because apparently he supports them, which I didn't know. But do any states currently have active red flag laws? And what is this, what is the status on that in the United States? It, it varies all the way across the board. There's some cities that do, some counties that do, and some states that do. And and some are being contested, some are not. Some died on the died on the vine. When they were trying to push them, they failed. I'm sure they're going to come back and make a major push. But this is going to be a major constitutional hurdle to that. So the I mean, the whole principle of getting around these was the idea that there's a community health exception to everything. That's what almost all these lockdown orders are based on. And what they shot down was there, if there's no community caretaking exception to the Fourth Amendment, why would there be a community caretaking to any other amendment? So uh, given that's why it was so critical that this decision be come down this way. Can you imagine community caretaking effectively means we can do whatever we want to take care of the community, even if it means violating your constitutional rights. It's a create it's it's a creative concept. I had never heard of it and didn't know how prevalent it was in US law. The other question I was going to ask was: yeah, can you raise new arguments before the Supreme Court that you had not raised before the lower courts? Generally, no, but they usually let them the state and the feds get away with it. Okay, because I, I figured it has to be the same thing here. Here, you can't raise arguments that were not raised in argument before the lower courts, nor can you appeal to facts that were not already uh, adduced.